yesterday, Ms. Haraji spoke about the word Samboda, Sambodhi, which is part of the, the larger word Sambojanga. Sambojanga is made up of Sambodhi and Anga. And Sayadawji explained about Sambodhi last night. Sambodhi is knowledge which is able to know completely the Four Noble Truths. Without this, um, Sambodhi must be present to know the Four Noble Truths. One can't, um, that, that has to be present. But it is not the only thing that is involved in the realization of the Four Noble Truths. So together with knowledge, there are other components. And so Sambodhi is, uh, is this knowledge which is able to know completely the Four Noble Truths. Or another way uh, of explaining the meaning of Sambodhi is that it refers to someone who practices the forerunner path to completion so that vipassana knowledge knowledge matures stage by stage and one comes to know the Four Noble Truths. So first of all, with the four, uh, before completion of Vipassana knowledge and realization of all the Four Noble Truths, with the forerunner path, Bhubhabhaga Maga, one accomplishes the first two truths. One knows the truth of suffering and eliminates its cause and develops this forerunner path. But with the real, realization of Nibbana, the remaining two truths, the, realiza- the uh, cessation of suffering and the path, development of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, these are automatically accomplished. So one who knows this who knows the Four Noble Truths completely, is called Sambodhi. And this word uh, prefix, Sam, Samanta, it it has the meaning, a meaning comprehensively or completely knowing, uh, knowing all that is surrounding. So there are four, um, there are seven causes which support this knowledge called Sambodhi. And if we take Sambodhi to mean knowledge, then these, uh, these total of seven factors are component well, supporting factors. And if we take Sambodhi to mean a person, then it is a quality that person has or a factor of that person. And that word in Pali is called Anga. So together in Pali, Sambodhi and Anga, (coughs) when they're combined, those two words are combined, it becomes Sambojanga. Among the Four Noble Truths, as far as the two supramundane truths, one has to know how they are good. One has to know that they are two very delightful, noble truths. But the work that we do at first concerns the first and second noble truth, the two worldly truths. Whatever arises in one's body is the truth of suffering, dukkha sacha. We have to know this. We have to discern this. If we don't observe 
whatever arises in our being, then we won't know this truth of suffering. We won't know or will know in the wrong way. There will be craving, tana, and clinging, upadana. And thus there will be the cause of suffering. But when the truth of suffering arises, because one observes it with the practice of satipatthana, then there is knowledge. Knowledge arises. And this is the development of the forerunner path, Bhubhapaga Maga. And at that moment, at that moment of knowledge, one is able to dispel the cause of suffering. One realizes momentary cessation, Tadanga Niroda. And one also develops this forerunner path. So as Sayadaji mentioned yesterday, with one action of knowing the knowing the first truth, the remaining three are accomplished. One knows the truth of suffering, dispels its cause, realizes cessation, and develops the path. So because the forerunner is path is developed and vipassana knowledge develops stage by stage, when this vipassana knowledge matures, then one realizes Niroda Satcha, the truth of cessation. One realizes Nibbana or knows Nibbana with the noble path. So whatever arises in our being, whether we're, we're throughout our day, we're eating, eating, drinking, lifting, moving, placing, tasting, touching, and so on, this all, one thing after another, flows like a river. This is called pavata. The sense, the sense experiences that happen all the time. Nibbana is called apavata because it is the cessation of this flowing river. So this is, this is nirodha. And one has, one reaches nirodha when there's the cessation of the sense experiences completely. So noble path arise, arises, this pure, clean, noble path. This arises which sees nibbana, and then one will understand very well what is meant by avedita sukha. The Buddha used the word sukha. Sukha means peaceful and therefore happiness, satisfaction. Beings like this peaceful happiness. Sukha, sukha kama, dukha tikula. People don't like, beings don't like suffering. And they like happiness and peace. This is the way of the world. This is the way beings are. This sukha has two varieties. And one involves... <clears throat> one involves contact with good sense objects and this is called Vedita Sukha <clears throat> and the second type does not involve any contact with, of the, with these six sense objects good se- six sense objects and it is peaceful so today, Sierraoji will present, explain about these two kinds of sukha, and the yogis simply need to decide for themselves which one of these is good. The first kind of sukha 
is what we experience when we uh, encounter an object that we like. So there may be a beautiful scene or we may see something, uh, someone of the opposite sex, or there might be a pleasant sound or a beautiful fragrance. And when we look at the scene, the, the, this beautiful scene, this beautiful visual object, then the mind feels clear and peaceful. The mind feels... Uh, and when one hears this pleasant sound, it makes the mind feel uh, at ease, feel calm and clear. So when we get this pleasant object that one likes, getting touch that one likes, for example, um, when we're cold, then it feels good to have something warm. When we're wo too warm, it feels good to have something cold. Or when one has been sitting for a long time, then it feels good to change the posture. Of course, nowadays, yogis don't sit long like that anymore. They shift uh, here and there uh, very easily. And even during the Dhamma talk, the yogis clasp their knees together and gaze here and there. They have no patience at all. When there's discomfort, people like comfort. And so people like the touch of clothing, for example, the gentle touch of clothing. People like the touch, male, males, males and females like this type of touch among themselves. So, and also people like to imagine things. People like to, uh, having an imaginary object also makes uh, people feel happy. Few people feel some peaceful happiness with this. So these six types of objects, things which are good to see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, imagine. When we experience these, we had, there's a feeling. And this feeling is called ved, vedita sukha, the happiness or peaceful happiness that comes from experiencing a sense object. And in the, uh, people think very highly of these, but the Buddha understood very well uh, this experiential happiness, Vedita Sukha, and he understood what is wrong with it. And he said that it is not true peace. It is uh, the, called Titi Sukha. That means that it's established only when that object that good object that we like is there. But when that good object changes or goes away, then what we experience is viparinama dukkha. We experience the suffering of how things change. And sometimes people uh, even really, when, when they're very attached to some type of experience, when they no longer have it, some people even die of the, of the uh, sorrow that they feel. So when one thinks that this type of sense experience is so good that one wants more and more, works to get more and more, then one only encounters more and more suffering. On the other hand, avedita sukha, does not involve any type of sense experience. It doesn't involve any uh, beautiful view, any pleasant sound, uh, any fragrance, any taste or touch. No external touch, no touch between male and female, no thinking, no imagining. It's not a happiness that comes from contacting any of these objects. So it's a special type of happiness that is completely separate from sense contact. 
and it, it is also called Santi Sukha. And this, it's called Santi Sukha because there is no disturbance due to greed, hatred, and the other kilesas. It's a very cool, peaceful happiness. Sorry. Human beings search for the sense objects that they like. They search for these things, such as a beautiful thing to look at, pleasant sound, pleasant smell, taste, touch. They search for these objects, and the objects that one desires capture one. They bind one so that one can't pull away. So it, but in time, Although one gains the object that one wants, in time, these become boring. They're no longer interesting to us. So then uh, we want to have... For example, how many hours can you look at a beautiful view? How many hours can you listen to a pleasant sound? The same thing with smells, taste, touch, even between the, op the opposite sex. With, uh, so people get bored with the experiences. And one wants one kind of experience after another. So in, eventually this, lead, this leads to many problems, including... Uh, we are trying to. Uh, we think it means group sex. What Sayadawji spoke about, lane pao piam mu. But, it, but basically, it leads to um, sexual indulgence that is outside of the bounds of uh, reasonableness, outside of the bounds of what is right. And if one follows what and goes after what one likes, then this fire of lust is burning in one's side, in one's, in one, in oneself. And when one doesn't get what one wants, then one, one feels depressed. When one gets what, gets what one wants, then one feels elated. And there's also the fire of anger, dissatisfaction, not liking what we have. And there's also the fire of moha, because one doesn't see the faults of sense pleasures. For ordinary people, these three fires of raga, dosa, and moha, greed, hatred, and delusion, are burning in turn, one after another. There's always the fire of delusion involved. Because, and because one doesn't know that one is burning. These are fires that don't emit any smoke, but they burn intensely inside of one. And only when these fires die down will one feel peaceful. There are many problems that come from these fires burning. So although experiential happiness, Vedita Sukha, is good, it burns us. It, it, it has a certain heat and it can burn. So on the, on the other hand, the happiness that doesn't involve any sense experiences doesn't it doesn't have any heat like this. The five sense objects are not involved. So that, that is the happiness that the Buddha himself searched for and found. It's not something imagined. The practice that we are doing now is to cool the fires of lust and anger greed and hatred slowly, gradually and then the cool peace 
of Nibbana will arise. Now we are practicing to make the uh, kilesas of raga, dosa, and moha, greed, anger, and delusion, peaceful. The gross kilesas are being overcome with the training of sila. The medium level kilesas are being overcome with the training of samadhi. And the refined kilesas are being overcome with the training of wisdom. So this is the path that leads to avidita sukha. Or it is the path to gain santi sukha. The Buddha himself followed this path and found that type of happiness. So for people who don't experience this type of happiness, uh, by way of comparison, <clears throat> try to find a happiness like this in the world. And here's an example. Imagine, <clears throat> imagine that there's a person the person has money, and for that person it's easy to get nice things to look at, pleasant things to listen to, beautiful things to smell, great things to eat, pleasant things to touch. That person has no difficulty obtaining what he or she wants. But experiencing these things again and again gets to be tiring, gets to be boring. Can you experience these things 24 hours a day? No. You have to take a rest. So the person goes to bed. They go to bed in their own bed and they go to sleep. And imagine that this person is sleeping quite soundly. And someone in his or her household comes and brings one of the things that he or she likes and wakes him up or her up. How does that person feel? That person will not be at all satisfied because he or she was having a good, peaceful sleep. And when the person wakes up, not being woken up, but it wakes up after having a sleep like that, they even praise such a sleep. What a good sleep I had. However, if you were to ask, that person would not be able to explain if you asked, well, what's good about it? However, uh, that person knows, and we know when we sleep well, we know that, th that this exists. It's not uh, something that can be explained. It's also something that can't be denied. So the happiness of a good sleep is something that happens in the world that is like the happiness that does not involve sense pleasures. So in the happiness of sleep, we're not seeing something beautiful. We're not hearing something, hearing a nice sound, not smelling the beautiful jasmine flowers, not tasting good food, and we're not even aware of the soft bed. In fact, after one falls asleep, one might as well be on the ground or on the floor. So, None of the things that one's like, one likes are being experienced during sleep, during this nice good sleep. There's not even imagination going on. So in, in, um, this sound sleep uh, is, without, is a type of happiness that happens without involvement of six, the six sense objects. And this is, the one type of happiness in the world 
that is like the happiness of Avidita Sukha. When one works all day to get money so that one can provide for one's family things like clothing and shelter and food, one works all day and at the end of the day one is both tired and hungry. So one comes home from work feeling both hungry and tired. So what will one do first? Go to bed and take a rest? Or will, or will one have something to eat? And of course there may be some people who are very fond of food and they will eat first. However, most people will probably first go to have a rest. And what happens when one has a rest after being, one, one goes to sleep both tired and hungry, but when one wakes up, one feels energetic and fresh. One both gets rest and one's hunger is relieved because of the rest. And Sayadaraji himself experienced this, although it was not because he was tired out from working for his family, such as a wife and children. Uh, but he experienced how, after a good sleep, he felt both energetic and fresh. And so uh, this type of happiness, this type of uh, peace, comes without any involvement of sense objects. And because we hear people say, what a good sleep, we, can, uh, we know that it is good because this is how people describe a sound sleep. So we know that this is good, and still we are not able to explain what this happiness is. However, one can't deny that it is good. And when we practice satipatthana, if we do so according to the instructions, respectfully, meticulously, continuously uh, one can gain this type of happiness and for someone who um, for someone who is smart then even in one week one can gain this type of happiness in two weeks in one month one can gain this so one needs to work according to the instructions and although, um, although one hasn't gained this type of happiness, when one gains, when one gains it, one will know uh, practically that there is this better type of happiness than sense pleasures. The way that Nibbana is praised, this happiness of Nibbana is susukhaṁ vatad nibbānaṁ samasambuddha desitaṁ Asokang virajang kemang yata dukang nirojati. So, this in nibbana, suffering is not present. Nibbana in nibbana, suffering comes to an end. There's no uh, obvious form of suffering. There's no suffering due to something changing, there is no suffering of sense experience. All these things die away, come to an end in Nibbana. So this is a happiness, susukang vatan Nibbanan. This happiness is very good. This is a guaranteed happiness. It's the happiness that the Buddha himself taught. Sama Sambuddha Desitang. It's described as Asoka. That means that there's no sorrow, no sadness in this Nibbana. There's nothing gained and lost. Also, it's described as Viraja. That means that there's no dust. 
these defilements, the defilements wanting, wanting various things, dissatisfaction, resentment, bearing grudges, pride, lack of shame, lack of moral fear, all these things are like little particles of dust in our existence. And they're like the dust that is on the road. So there's no dust like this, none of, none of the dust of kilesas in Nibbana. And it's also described as kema. There are many dangers in the world, the dangers of fire, flood, thieves, and so on. There's none, no dangers in Nibbana, so it is called Kema. And to get this happiness, this peaceful happiness that is described in such a way, we, we, work, we apply the practice. That's, that's all, all we need to do. So the yogis haven't yet seen Nibbana, but by understanding this example, they can understand something about its peace. The Buddha himself found a happiness that is peaceful. And this, um, so one should just think about it. This, this happiness, uh, when your meditation is in a good situation, you can understand that this that there is this happiness that comes. It is, uh, it is free of sorrow. It is free of the, uh, the, the defilements of greed, hatred, and delusion. It is free of all dangers. And when we get to this type of place, we feel very peaceful. So this is, this is something that, are, that makes our human life very valuable. So try, try to apply the instructions in the practice and see what happens. One can't work half-heartedly. One can't work with uh, sort of believing halfway. So one just has to try following the instructions and one has to um, work respectfully. So today Sayadaji has spoken about what it is that this knowledge called Sambodhi takes as its object and also the person who gains this knowledge of Sambodhi. So in order to gain this knowledge of Sambodhi, there are supporting factors that arise together with it. And tomorrow, Sieroji will explain about, about these supporting factors. And he will also explain how, uh, when the mind is elated, what factors need to be boosted. 